Hey, special educators, I'm Jennifer from Positively Learning. Welcome to the Special Educators Resource Room. If you're like me, you're always looking for ways to save time and streamline your work. That's why this podcast was created, to give you the systems and solutions you need to get your time back. Tune in for tips, tricks, and tools that will help you manage your workload and make the most of your time. Whether you're brand new or experienced, all are welcome in the Special Educators Resource Room. Hey, Special Educators, this is Jennifer from Positively Learning. Thanks for stopping in. Today, we're going to be talking all about task boxes, and I'm going to be busting some myths, some common misconceptions. These are all real things I've either been asked or have come up in conversation. Maybe you're thinking this is a repeat topic because I do talk about task boxes quite a bit. You can head back to episode 12 where I give my tips for getting started and choosing the right task boxes. I do talk about them quite a bit because I was obsessed with them. I made a big switch in the resource room from using more traditional centers to individual task boxes, and it was a game changer. So I am very passionate. I love to talk about it, and I am going to do my best to convince you to make the switch. Okay, not really, but These tips are going to be useful if you use any type of independent work system in your resource room setting. I will be calling them task boxes, but feel free to substitute file folders, bins, trays, student binders, whatever works for you. Let's start off with an easy myth to bust. This myth is that task boxes or task box work system is time consuming to set up. In my own experience, it was exactly the opposite. Before I made the big switch, I was using traditional centers and I would prepare them. It involved printing, laminating, cutting out the pieces, and they were often quite large. They would work for the entire class. And I would set those up to keep for one week, two weeks, or maybe a month. For task boxes, I found that they were much smaller and easier to set up. I thought of it almost like a assembly line. Let's take the example of the center. I wasn't going to get rid of my centers, even though they weren't quite working for us. But instead, I grabbed the center, I set up three or four task boxes, and I divided it up. If I had 30 student cards, I would put eight to 10 in each task box. Grabs any kind of manipulatives, whether it's a math task or letter tiles, and I would drop a handful in each task box, close it up, ready to go. To me, it was much faster to create several task boxes versus one large center. Let's stay with the theme of centers for this next myth. Task boxes are the same thing as centers. Well, it's easy to see how they could be confused. I just explained how I turned my centers into individual task boxes. And they both have our students interacting with hands-on learning resources. But the purpose between task boxes and centers are actually very different. Centers are often provided to reinforce instructional content. So even though the resources might be the same as the task box, the purpose is very different. Task boxes are provided at independent levels and their focus is on the process. Students are accessing the task, completing the work from start to finish because the purpose of a task box is to build those independent skills. So yes, they may look very same from the outside observer, but the purpose of each activity is very different. And now I'm going to completely contradict myself with this next myth. Ready? Task boxes are solely for independent work activities. So I just got done explaining the difference between centers and task boxes and how task boxes are a great opportunity to build our students' confidence and increase their independent work stamina. However, task boxes can be used in so many other ways. In fact, my students were so engaged with them that I was always looking for opportunities to bring task boxes into our learning, whether it was grabbing one for a performance task and getting a quick data point, or 
even bringing task boxes into our small group instruction. One of my favorite ways to use them was as a warm up. So everyone's at the small group table and I've got a task box and I'm going to start modeling the task. Let's say it's a sorting activity. So I may be using some think alouds to incorporate some language. I'm opening up the task box and I begin sorting the cards. And my student's job is to guess how I'm sorting them. And if they're ready, they could talk amongst themselves and see if they can figure it out together. That's a great opportunity for higher order thinking. I've also had where my students were ready to take over the sort and work together and finish up the task cards. Moving ahead, we have two more myths to bust. This next one is a great one. Task boxes are limited to specific subject areas like math or literacy. Yeah, that is definitely a myth. They are wonderful for math and literacy and science and social studies, but you could also use task boxes for social emotional learning. Maybe it's a sorting activity between kind and unkind, or students are reading a scenario and choosing a appropriate action. Task cards can also be used for fine motor skill development and life skills. I really can't think of any subject area that wouldn't benefit from using task boxes. And now we have reached the last myth, and this one kind of gets under my skin a little bit. This myth is that task boxes lack academic rigor, or may be referred to as more busy work. Now, of course, I've already busted that myth throughout this whole podcast episode, explaining the different ways that our students benefit from using these types of tasks. Maybe this myth stems from the fact that task boxes seem like so much fun. Our students are really enjoying using them. However, that doesn't mean that they are simply busy work. Task boxes can be designed to address specific learning objectives, and our students can use critical thinking skills as they approach these challenging tasks. Now that we've busted through these myths, an important takeaway is that task boxes have so much potential. They are a versatile teaching tool, and you can customize them to meet your classroom needs and align with your students' goals. I will put a link in the show notes to a free set of task boxes so that you can try them out today. I will also put a link to the Task Box Dollar Club, which is a monthly club where you get new sets and you get all the past sets. You're going to have all the task boxes that your students need. Be sure to check out the show notes and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time in the Special Educators Resource Room. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'm dying to ask, what'd you think? Be sure to hit the follow or subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. You can find the show notes and links for everything mentioned in this episode at PositivelyLearningBlog.com. See you next week for more special education solutions.